Hi, Charles with the Book Sage here, and this is episode 14 of my Harry Potter first time reread series. If this is your first time here, I am in the middle of rereading the entire seven book Harry Potter series for the very first time, and I've taken the series and broken it up into about 52 different sections, and every Sunday I read a set of chapters, record my weekly vlog on it, and upload those on Mondays. So... If that's something you're interested in, like and subscribe. I also upload BookTube content on Wednesdays and Fridays. And now let's get into this week's episode. Originally, I was going to do the last two chapters of The Prisoner of Azkaban this week, and then the first three chapters of The Goblet of Fire. But I've decided instead of having one video um, crossover between two different books, I would just do the last two chapters of The Prisoner of Azkaban. So that is what today's video is going to be about, chapters 21 and 22 of The Prisoner of Azkaban, Hermione's Secret, and Owl Post Again. So, chapter 21, Hermione's Secret. Harry comes to in the infirmary, and he hearing Cornelius Fudge and Professor Snape talking nearby. And you hear Snape telling Fudge how it was the... The students who attacked him, but they must have been under like a confundus charm under Sirius Black's control, and they didn't know what they were doing. Um, but even still, he wants Harry punished because Harry always gets away with everything, and Harry shouldn't get away with anything. And it's interesting listening to the conversation because Snape is just determined to see how much trouble can I get Harry Potter in. And Cornelius Fudge is like, You're going to get commemoration. I don't know if it's an order of the lion or whatever it's called. I'm sorry. Someone can let me know in the comments down below. And, but Dumbledore eventually arrives and it's like, all right, everybody out. I have to talk to Harry and Hermione alone. And they all eventually leave though. Snape doesn't want to. And then Dumbledore turns to the two of them and lets them know, Hey, you have, you got to act quick. More than one life can be saved tonight. And he goes, three turns, I think three turns should do it, Hermione. And then he leaves. I'm gonna, and he says, I'm going to lock you in. Then he leaves. And Harry has no idea what's going on. And here we learn Hermione's secret. How has Hermione been going to multiple classes that all take place at the same time all throughout the entire semester? And then we discover she was given this little hourglass on a chain by Professor McGonagall. It's called a time turner. Each turn of it is an hour you go back into the past and it's really dangerous because time travel you can really just mess everything up you can end up killing yourself without even meaning to but Morganagal had trusted Hermione with it that she would use it only for school but of course here's Dumbledore saying you know that thing you're not supposed to have that you're not supposed to do do that <laughs> Which is one of those uh, interesting things about Dumbledore. And for the rest of the chapter, we get Hermione and Harry kind of retracing their steps uh, from three hours earlier. They leap backwards uh, in time to three hours prior. And they sort of follow themselves around while they go to Hagrid and right before Buckbeak is to be executed. And they manage to sneak Buckbeak out of there. And their plan is they have to kind of hide in the Forbidden Forest or hide in the outskirts of the forest and wait a couple of hours until Sirius Black is in the tower in Hogwarts where while Harry and Hermione and Ron are all unconscious in the infirmary to then fly up there and help Sirius Black escape. So it's a really interesting chapter here because it's basically told through the commentary of Harry and Hermione just kind of watching a replay of their day. And the movie does a really good job of this because this kind of scene just really works well in the visual medium of film. And you get to have fun with it and play around with it. And I didn't really think about it at the time of watching the movie, but there's very much kind of a back to the future feel here as well, particularly the second movie where he goes back again and he's like running around in his own in the past twice and trying not to get into his his own way even though he's there visiting the past two two, two different times so 
um, there's a kind of that vibe, <laughs> which is really cool. And it was, it's well done here. It's not easy to do in book form because uh, it's sort of passively retelling what you've already read in real time just a few chapters ago. But Rowling does a really, really good job of it. And I do love how when we're getting closer and closer to when the Dementors attacked in the last chapter and Harry's starting to convince himself that it was his own father that he saw and if Peter Pettigrew could really be alive, maybe his father could really be alive. And they managed, though, to get back to Hagrid's with Buckbeak. Everyone's up at the castle at this point. They watch everything go down between them running to the tree and coming back and um, Lupin transforming into the werewolf and all that stuff. But Harry leaves Hermione with Buckbeak, and he just wants to go out because he's like, someone has to keep watch so we know when it's time to go rescue Sirius from the tower. And then he's determined, however, to go and see his father because he's convinced his father was the one who called the Patronus and he's going to go and watch. He has, he can't help himself. And as he's watching, he started, he finally hits him that it wasn't his father who called the Patronus. It was him. And because he realized he was the one who called the Patronus, he was able to do it. And he calls up and it turns out to be a stag. And he kind of realizes that that has some prongs from the Mooney, Wormtongue, Padfoot, and Prongs map. That Prongs must be his father. So it's somehow connected to his father. And they manage to, at this point, take Puckbeak, fly up to the tower, and they rescue Sirius Black. And Sirius Black and Buckbeak fly off. And that's pretty much how the chapter ends. It's really quick because it's mostly retelling and rewatching what you just read in the previous like couple of chapters from an observer's point of view. Uh, and just the weirdness of it from the two of them of how strange it is to watch yourself do things. And I do like how the movie handled it by those little kind of moments where, you know, like I think it's Hermione throws a little stone to distract somebody or distract themselves, and um, which doesn't take place in the book. The movie kind of layered and a few extra things in, but taking advantage of the visual medium of film, they're able to do that. That really... Um, didn't work in the book as much. So it's just pretty much them trying to stay out of the way as much as possible and not have any interaction of any kind. So it was interesting now because having seen the movie so many times and having only read this book once originally, it was interesting to read that scene now over again as written word. And um, so it was a, a very different experience than what I'm so used to in the film. But again, it's a pretty straightforward chapter. Uh, nice reveal with the time turner um, from Hermione. And just, of course, a Dumbledore. Another indication that Dumbledore is kind of a bit more aware than what he may let on about things. And I imagine it wouldn't be surprising that McGonagall would just kind of let the, you know, the headmaster know that, hey, I gave Hermione a time turner. So... Because I imagine Dumbledore would have noticed, hey, Hermione's taking like 20 classes. <laughs> so, um, but a fun chapter, interesting chapter, a challenging chapter for her, um, for Rowling to write. But she did like really, really good job on it. But again, pretty straightforward. And then we get to the last chapter. Now it's chapter 22. I'll post again. Now Hermione... And Harry have to race back to the infirmary now. They've only got a few minutes because they, they have to get back to that infirmary before Dumbledore locks that door and then they won't be able to get back in. And there'll be no way for them to explain how they were kind of in bed a moment ago and then outside a locked door. And just as Dumbledore is leaving and you hear him say, I three turns should do it, they come up to him uh, as he closes the door and... 
he to kind of let him know that they were successful. And he's really happy about it. And he's like, waits a moment. It's like, yeah, I think you're gone now. You've time turned. And then he lets them in and then locks them in. And they sneak back into bed. And Madame Pomfrey is in her office still. And she comes out. And then you hear this, like, scream. And it's Snape because they've discovered that Black, um, that Black is gone. And here they come. And Snape is just really just like a lunatic at this point. He bursts into the infirmary. He's accusing Harry Potter of being behind this, which, of course, Harry actually is. And Fudge looking at Snape like, like you're out of your mind. What's wrong with you? Well, like what what is wrong with you? And Fudge, you can see, is really disturbed by how just kind of psychotic Snape is in this scene. And Dumbledore is just kind of behind them, just kind of having a laugh about it, kind of enjoying <laughs> Snape doing this to himself in a way. And uh, that's been a bit of a pattern in this book with Snape. It's because Snape was has had to like directly confront his own trauma from his time as a student in Hogwarts by having Lupin there and Sirius Black on the loose. You see, it's almost like post-traumatic stress of Snape all just kind of coming to the surface. And he doesn't know how to handle it. He doesn't seem to be equipped to handle it. Because it seems like all these years he's just really just bottled this up and kept it inside of himself. Which is probably partly to do with why he can be such a miserable bastard in many ways. Because he holds on to this pain and doesn't let it go. And doesn't Maybe doesn't know how to let it go. Maybe doesn't want to let it go. I don't know. But it ends up putting him in this situation here where he's forced to confront it and doesn't really know how. And takes it out, unfortunately, on Harry and really Hermione a lot earlier in the book. Uh, but just, it's a really interesting look uh, psychologically at Snape and who he is as a person and how damaged he is as a person. And then if you take all the other pressure he's on that you now you know about if you're doing a reread of the position kind of Dumbledore has put him in, um, that begins to also grow and grow and grow on him as the story goes. And But it's just, it's really an interesting, Snape is really interesting in this. He's a total bastard in this book, but he's not a bastard because he's just a villain. It, there's a lot of, like I said, young trauma that he this is really never dealt with that is kind of really eating away at him. So really, really interesting. And again, I like looking at parallels between Snape and Draco Malfoy. And because Draco is in a different position than Snape, because Draco is a powerful family, and he's got the name recognition, the prestige. But you also have this animosity where he's this like singular person faced with the animosity of Harry Potter and his group of friends. Like Snape was faced with James Potter and his group of friends, even though Snape's position and Draco's are very different. But I still see some of the parallels and similarities there. If Draco is going down a similar road uh, in this generation here, which is really interesting, too, because we'll see the direction that Draco is pulled in by his own family and his name and all those things. And I wonder, like, what is Draco 20, 30 years later? I mean, we see the little glimpse of him at the epilogue in Book 7, but how much of the trauma of everything Draco goes through in this whole series is going to come out later on in his life. We'll probably never get to see that, but it's just something uh, to, to kind of think about looking at what it's done to Snape here in this book, because we really see him starting to crack in places because of it. Just kind of my thoughts on it. I mean, it's easy to just hate Snape if you just look at him as a like one or two dimensional character, but he is really uh, an intricate and many layered and character here because again, it's not just that he's a bad guy, he's a villain or he's just an asshole, that there is actual trauma underneath all this that kind of feeds this. 
It doesn't necessarily excuse his behavior, but it does help inform it. And I think um, it's been a really, really interesting read. Uh, I have absolutely loved this third book. It was my favorite of the series the first time around. And it's firmly planted at back at the top, at least as far as these first three books go. And it's interesting here, and one of the reasons why I decided to not immediately dive into the first three chapters of Goblet of Fire in this video is I just want to kind of look back at the first three books. I look at the first three books as the sort of act one of the whole Harry Potter series. And that act has now come to a close here. And looking at how things were at the beginning of the Sorcerer's Stone and how they are now at the end of the Prisoner of Azkaban is a really different dynamic in play now, particularly in Harry's life. Yes, he still has to go back to the Dursleys, but Sirius Black is there and it's his godfather. So there is that other, there's more to Harry's life now outside of Hogwarts than just the Dursleys. And even though circumstances are such that Black has to be in hiding and he's on the run and all those things, it still really just kind of shifts the whole playing field for Harry mentally in terms of what his own life is like, that he's not alone anymore. Even though, you know, the Dursleys are family, but he doesn't really, you, you kind of see that he doesn't really even feel them, that they're family. And they do really nothing to make him feel like family either, even though they are. At least his aunt is a blood relative. But knowing Sirius Black is there and out there now and innocent and is his godfather, it really is a whole new layer to Harry's life and Harry's mentality. And this has been a nice, really interesting journey through these first three books. Uh, there's a lot more in this. And this is why, um, for me, why it's why it was my favorite book the first time around. Because this Prisoner of Azkaban book is the store, the book where I realize there's a lot more to this story than we got to see in the first two books. I enjoyed the first two books. But um, they were more of a younger audience and a simpler kind of construct. But in this book, we really she took things up a notch. Rowling really added a whole new dimension to this Harry Potter world. We begin to really see the dark sides of it, the dangers of it. Uh, and again, this was such a deeply personal, personal experience for Harry. Unlike the first two, it's all new, it's all wizarding, wondrous stuff, even as dangerous as it got. This one is extremely visceral and personal for him. And it's been cathartic in a, in a certain way for him to go through the journey that he goes through in this book. And again, for me, it's really where the story takes off. And it is a great ending to that first act of this story. And I'm really, really looking forward to Goblet of Fire. I remember absolutely loving the whole opening set of chapters uh, where he goes to the Weasleys and then they go off to the Quidditch World Cup. I'm really looking forward to reading that again. Um, that was a lot of fun from what I remember uh, reading it the first time. I really enjoyed uh, that opening because it was more than just your typical, oh yeah, crappy Dursleys for a chapter, and then okay, it's on to the train. We, you know, just each of these books we could see a little bit more and more and more of the world, even before Harry gets to school. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. But I want to hear your thoughts on The Prisoner of Azkaban. Where does it rank for you in the seven book series? And do you remember at all the first time you reread it? And what your thoughts were on a reread? And yeah, I just want to hear kind of what your thoughts are in this book. And I'm repeating myself now, so I'm just going to wrap this up. I will see you next week for episode 15. It's going to be at least the first three chapters of the Goblet of Fire. I have to kind of go back through my schedule and tweak a little bit to see what chapters are going to be, how they're going to break down for the rest of the series, since I, I'm not doing those three chapters tonight. But 
This has been a absolute wonderful, wonderful reading experience to reread this book for the very first time. And I am going to sign off here. I am Charles of Book Sage. Happy reading. <laughs>